Okay, so um, thank you very much. And um, I'm representing today an organisation called Kate Care, Cares Associates. And um, we work across the country on a number of um, topics which relate particularly to vulnerable children and children who are um, experiencing difficulties very early in life. Now, um, one of the things you've asked me to do, or I was invited to do, is cover such a wide number of topics that actually um, each of these topics deserve a whole day in their own right. So Care Cares Associates, their mission is to improve the lives of vulnerable people by changing the practice of those who work with them. And we do this by sharing transformative knowledge, encouraging deep reflective practice and empowering individuals and organisations to make a difference. What we've noticed in the, um, the study of early attachment, neuroscience and um, the impact that that has on later life, <coughs> that the small things make a difference. John Bowlby, people really didn't believe him when he said that actually the maternal love can determine the future of every single child. And that is every single child. And this quote here, the pathway followed by each developing individual and the extent to which he or she becomes resilient to stressful life events is determined to a very significant degree by the pattern of attachment developed through the early years. So what we recognise is that from conception through the lifetime, how we develop is strongly connected to the relationships and to the connections we make in the world. And actually how those outside of us get us and understand us. One of the things that I think is really important is that we recognise that attachment theory and attachment behaviours belong to and exist in every human being. And that babies are born with the instinct through their reptilian, their ancient brain, to claim the adults and the community that they come into. Irrespective of whether you have a, um, a genetic condition or whether you have any difficulties um, um, that are then to be later discovered, a baby is born to survive. That baby who comes out and cries and connects with us in the first moments of both, both breath, they are asking us to claim them, to claim them and bring them into the world and bring them up, whoever they might become and be. Uh, and be. So John Bowlby's attachment theory, theory, I believe, has strong uh, relevance for our school and education and systems and beyond, from birth and to death. I believe that the, the connections and relationships that we make over time are the things that shape us. They are the things that continue to shape the neu neurological connections in our brain. The moment we smile at a baby, the moment we serve and return the communication that they send out to us, are the moments that we're building the neuroconnectivity within the, the child's brain. What we do know is that all babies are born to survive. And even though some babies' attachment mechanisms may be weaker or appear different to those of other children, those children still need the adults around them for survival. And those families who talk about early, um, early identification and concerns about their child uh, not reaching out and claiming them as their parents will know that they have to relentlessly look to attune to that baby's needs look to make sure that those babies' basic needs are met. Look to play, to engage, to watchfully understand what that child is wanting from that loving, caring adult. And in an optimal world, actually every single child will receive that, that, that care. But what we do know, in any population of children, there are children whose responsive and attuned parenting sometimes leaves some of those things out and therefore those, those children learn to survive in spite of their early relationships. So one of the things that we need to think about when we're thinking about children with um, uh, learning difficulties and particularly children who may then later be diagnosed on the autistic spectrum is issues which might have an impact on attachment. Is the baby able to produce the attachment behaviours? Do they reach out to claim their adult? What might affect the ability of the baby to generate an effective attachment strategy? Our attractive attachment behaviours seek to bring in the adult to care for us, to love us, 
to feed us, to keep us warm, and mostly to interact with us in order for us to make sense of the world. We are all and have all been dependent on those loving caregivers from birth. And the other question will be, for all children, not just children for whom we may have concerns later on, does the parent engage with the baby's attachment behaviours? Is the context into which the baby is born conducive to a parent, parent being able to show undivided attention, being able to show attuned um, responsiveness to the child's desire for being loved, cuddled, warmed, swaddled, and of course, fed, loved and nurtured. So, formative experiences on a baby's brain are a multitude of influences. We have our genetic inheritance. We have events during pregnancy, illnesses and accidents. We have maternal exposure to toxins, alcohol, drugs and toxic stress. And even events during birth, such as lack of oxygen, head trauma. So we know a large number of children, or quite a high percentage of children, and especially those who are born prematurely, um, often are born with a compromise of brain function already. And therefore their exposure and interactions with adults in, the, in their world is vitally important to de develop their uh, presence in the world and to support their longer term outcomes. So we do know that some babies may be less able to access the brain building benefits of a secure attachment relationship. And those babies may well be babies and toddlers who are later identified with having social communication difficulties and other difficulties associated with autistic spectrum disorders. So what we need to focus on in the context of these young children coming into our settings, schools and further education establishments is being able to support that child's learning through um, availability of attachment-like relationships. It is important that teachers and other significant ad adults can provide the important secure base and safe haven that children need to learn. So any of you working within the EYFS, the Early Years Foundation stage, will know that the characteristics of effective learning require a child to reach out, to make connections, to take risks, to be a critical thinker, to be able to explore. All of these things depend on having a secure base and a safe haven of which to return to for your emotional recharging of the battery. So one of the things we must think about in our schools and our settings is are we attachment aware? Do we recognise the importance of safe spaces, safe places, safe people? So that those children who struggle with levels of anxiety which prevent them from learning can actually go somewhere, see someone, be in touch with someone, connect with someone in order to recharge those batteries, be co-regulated through their emotional state and being able to access learning. So we need to provide children with attachment-like relationships. Positive associations have been found between the quality of the practitioner-child relationship and achievement. So we know the quality of relationships in your schools, in your settings, in your colleges, in your universities, will to a certain extent determine the quality of outcomes for those pupils. And those three aspects are aspects of what we call our executive function. The last part of our brain that develops through early interactions is our prefrontal cortex right here in front of our, our um, uh, skulls. Our prefrontal cortex, our left and right brain. We start to integrate our experiences, make rational and reasonable responses. It's also in control of our emotional responses. So that, uh, in, um, sorry, that executive function is really quite important. And what we know is impairments in exe executive function are shared by a number of groups of children who struggle to learn. So if we think about our pupils with ADHD, if we think about our pupils on the autistic spectrum, if we think about our pupils who've got ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, if we think about our students who may have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, all those children share the impairment of that prefrontal cortex region and specifically the executive function skills. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. 
So attachment, security and insecurity. What I've already mentioned is that uh, roughly 60% of children are securely attached. The bond, the affect bond, which is um, started with the maternal uh, uh, nurturing and the close family nurturing, the primary attachment figure. So 60% of your children are securely attached. That's an estimate, and depending on which research you read, that can go from a third to half of the child population having secure attachments. Okay, so we are looking at figures that actually are moving, not down, but up. We're looking at populations of children whose secure attachment uh, definition is actually decreasing. So 40% of children are insecurely attached. Um, and as it says there, the proportion of children in certain environments, in environments where, where deprivation and poverty um, influence the, the availability of the caregiving attuned parent, those figures actually increase quite statistically high. 25% of that 40% actually develop avoid, avoidant <coughs> attachment, where they avoid the parent when distressed, as the parent regularly ignores their emotional needs. Remember what I said at the beginning, every baby is born to survive. They will survive in spite of the availability of that caregiver. They may not thrive, but they will survive. 15% resist their parent, as the parent often amplifies their distress or responds unpredictably. And this leads to what we call disorganised attachment. So international research, what does that suggest? International research suggests that insecurely attached children are at higher risk of externalising problems. On average, they have poor language development and weaker executive function, as I've already, already referred to. They uh, find difficulty with skills associated with working memory and cognitive flexibility. Is this ringing any bells for children who you know who are on the autistic spectrum? That executive function impairment is quite significant. That lack of ability for flexible thinking, planning ahead, so, uh, solving problems, is one of the core difficulties that youngsters find in our busy schools, busy curriculums, busy corridors, busy playgrounds. Um, they are also less resilient to poverty, family instability and parental stress and depression. Approximately 60% of children who are diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder also have coexisting mental health difficulties. One of the things that we often notice is the first diagnosis of a child is the one that dominates our interventions. But actually for many young people what we need to do is look very much deeper. We need to understand that some of those parts of those conditions, some of those responses, some of that dysregulation may not actually be linked with autistic spectrum disorder. It may be that we need to look at that emotional well-being of that young person and how they are getting on and managing within our educational system. So I'm going into the next aspect, which is neuroscience. And I'm not a neuroscientist. And one of the things we need to look at when we're thinking about providing an enabling environment and enabling curriculum is how do we cater for children's need for a secure base, a safe haven, and the ability for them to have someone to co-regulate their emotional abilities. So neurodevelopmental disorders, there are many. Um, and actually, we're coming to understand that actually many of the disorders that we have um, had thought previously had other causal factors. There's a lot of um, evidence that the neuroscience now is uncovering about the source and the causation of these. So, attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyper hyperactive disorder, autism, specific learning, uh, uh, specific language impairment, SPLD, they're all described as neural developmental disorders. They come under that umbrella term that actually these children are learning differently because their neural pathways have been connected differently, their exposure uh, to uh, learning has been directed differently. They are thought to be caused by non-typical development of the brain. Okay? All of our brains are wired differently. The way we're hearing this, the way we're processing this, the way we're using the information we knew already to connect with this will be happening differently in every single one of our brains. I looked at this meta-analysis of autism attachment 
Uh, it's still only on very small numbers. But there were 10 studies looked at, considering and involving 287 children. The strange situations procedure was followed, which is Mary Ainsworth's procedure, in looking at how a child, um, um, following separation, reunites with their secure attachment figure, usually the mother figure. So using this strange situation procedure, which is used with, with all children, um, to look at attachment, uh, uh, quality of attachment, in the four studies, the average percentage of secure attachment was 53%. So secure attachment is compatible with autistic spectrum disorders. Okay? One of those things that some people assume is that children on the autistic spectrum cannot develop secure attachment relationships. On a small scale, we are looking at evidence that that is not so. And that a secure attachment relationship, if it predetermines good outcomes, should be something that we seek through the delivery of our enabling environment and our curriculum, our relationships with the adults in our context. Having said that, children did display less attachment security than comparison to children without autism. And the difference disappeared in samples with higher cognitive development. So those children with autism plus a severe learning difficulty um, showed less uh, attachment security than those children who had autistic spectrum disorders and a higher level of cognitive ability. If you go back to my earlier slide or my earlier uh, expression about how babies claim their um, world, their community and their caregivers. So a child who's affected by severe learning difficulty, maybe uh, an impairment, a sensory impairment, or a physical impairment, their ability to claim their world, to claim their adult, will to be um, impaired. So we're looking at multiple layers of reasons why that child cannot reach out and claim their adult. So the difference disappeared in some sort of higher cognitive development. So we can't dismiss attachment as being a key uh, aspect of successful educational outcomes because we know it's important for all children therefore it is important for our children on the autistic spectrum so the conclusions from that meta-analysis was that attachment security is compatible with autism and can be assessed using the strange situation type of procedures you can google that and see the strange situation procedure um, on youtube where autism is accompanied with a severe learning difficulty, there appears to be a stronger association with attachment insecurity. That may be to do with that ability to claim and be claimed at that very early stage of life. And that was in the Journal of Psychiatry, uh, Child Psychology and Psychiatry, 2004. So let's think about attachment and its importance for all children. If we're thinking about an attachment-aware school, an attachment-aware setting, or further education establishment, these four S's are really important. If I think about inclusive education, one of the things that I often talk about is being seen, being welcomed, and being missed. Noticing that you're there. Noticing when you're not there. Being held in mind, which is a very, very significant aspect of feeling that you belong that somebody has missed you, somebody has thought about you, and somebody is welcoming you back. It's safe, not just physically safe, but emotionally safe. Where a child, a young person, an adult can be soothed, what we know about neuroscience and the brain is it works in response to our nervous system. If our nervous system becomes stressed or anxious, it sends a little message, rather a big message, to our ancient brain that says, guess what, fight, flight, freeze. And a lot of those children who find school an anxiety-provoking situation spend a lot of their day in that ancient part of their brain. We call it, Dan Siegel refers to it as their lower brain. The lower brain is in control. So we can't get to the upstairs brain. We can't get to the upstairs brain with rationality, language, um, emotional regulation, we're stuck in our downstairs brain. If we're stuck in our downstairs brain, we're going to be on high alert. So we need the system, the uh, approach to our education to recognise that if we are hyper aroused, if we are on high alert, that actually there is a place or a relationship which can enable so soothing of that nervous system, a calming of that nervous system.
And we need to feel secure. We need to know that actually where we are being exposed to new experiences, that those experiences are scaffolded for us, that we are well prepared for those. Those children who have social emotional difficulties, difficulties with rigid behaviour and unpredictability, how we provide them with cues and reminders and social stories, etc., etc., can help them feel secure in their learning environment. It's not just a whim to be able to provide those, it's absolutely essential. It's actually providing a platform of calm for that child to be able to know what comes next. It should be a tool of high quality, first quality teaching that we are able to signpost and support children in this way to deal with their own emotional dysregulation. So the safe haven and the secure base that actually every single child, and uh, particularly child children who are struggling to learn in the usual environment, need a space where they can have a safe haven and a secure place to explore from. Um, they need to be able to have a space and a time and a place for co-regulation and co-learning. They need to be able to shift between, and we're not just talking young children, they need to be able to shift between relatively uh, relative dependency to interdependence to independence. And that we see that on an everyday basis, children move through these phases in order to access learning. So I'm now going to take you on to research that's been done by Barry Carpenter, and um, he um, spoke at the NAHT conference last week as well. Um, and uh, it's research that actually is, is talking about 21st century children in a 21st century school system. That actually it is the norm to have children whose um, um, diagnoses and conditions and impairments coexist with one another, interlock with one another, and actually present us with a complex nature of needing to understand what teaching, uh, good teaching and learning is for those individual children. So, um, Carpenter's uh, definition of complex learning difficulties, you can see it said, they present with a range of issues in combination of layered needs. Mental health, relationships, behavioural, physical, medical, sensory communication and cognitive. <coughs> in all sorts of uh, measures together. That their attainments may be inconsistent, presenting an atypical e and uneven profile, <coughs> and in the school setting, learners may be working at an educational level, including national curriculum, when our levels are gone, and peace scales. Um, this definition can be applicable to learning in, um, in early years and post school, school settings. They are often the children who think, do you know what? This, I just can't get this. I just don't understand how to <coughs> learn for this young person. So this complexity of need. So common features, and um, Rona Tuck talks, talks about this, common features of um, coexisting interlocking um, impairments are that they're broadly uh, conditions that are described as neurodevelopmental. There's a biological basis which isn't yet, not yet understood. The symptoms overlap with other disorders and there's a tendency to coexist with each other or with other disorders. So actually, we're on a journey of discovery. I'm standing up here talking about neuroscience, autism, attachment, etc., etc. We have got such a long way to go, believe you me. But what is really interesting is we now know many things that actually we, assume, we, could, we only assumed maybe a decade, a decade and a half ago because of the neuroscience, because of MRI scans, because of those sorts of things. We can actually see it. It's knowledge we now need to apply to our pedagogy. If we actually accept the scientific research that says actually neurodiversity is present in every classroom, then we need to respond to that with a reflective pedagogy. Um, Yuta Freeth, and I, but was it Yuta? No, it's Rita Jordan who came and spoke here. But um, she says, um, she's the chair of the uh, Forum for Neuroscience and Special Education, of which I'm a member. Education is concerned with enhancing learning, and neuroscience is concerned with understanding mechanisms of learning. It seems only logical that one should inform the other. And actually there is a, a, a new um, organisation or a network of educationalists and neuroscientists coming together under UTA and uh, Rona Tutt to discuss exactly that, the correlation between these aspects. 
So we continue to learn about the brain's plasticity and resilience. We continue to learn about the brain's capacity for changing and adapting. And of course, education plays a key role in that. The role of attachment relationships and experiences of conception in shaping the architecture of the brain. There's currently an all par parliamentary group on the um, conception to the age of two, the critical 1,001 days of life. Suddenly we have got strong interest in what actually starts very early on and the impact on outcomes on later outcomes. What does talk quickly refer back to those executive functions and learning, the ability to pay attention, the ability to plan, organise and prioritise, sequence, reason, problem solve, make decisions, control impulses. And this was a really interesting um, thought that came from Dean Beagle last week. But I want to talk next about engagement, because one of the things that's really important, if we're going to have um, engage, engage learners. We have to understand what that looks like from the point of view of the young person or the child. Is that the conceptualisation of engagement should recognise the importance of the intensity and emotional quality of children's involvement in initiating and carrying out activities. Quite often when we're struggling with children to engage them in a learning opportunity, we don't take account of the personal relevance that that activity needs to have for that child. We need to think about what's the purpose, what's the aim, what do they see out of it, what they're going to get out of it, the personal relevance. And Carpenter says, and I think this is very true, is without engagement, there's no deep learning. Um, there's no effective teaching, meaningful outcomes, and real attainment or quality progress. If our children are engaged in learning, they're not learning. I think I've got quite a bit more to go through, but I've... So, pedagogies for inclusion. Um, we now need to think back to the bigger picture. We've gone from attachment, to autism, <coughs> to neuroscience, to complex learning difficulties. Guess where we're back at? Teaching and learning. The, um, the fact that we need to understand how every pupil learns is at the seat of the better outcomes for every child. So we need to embrace the challenge of discovering and investigating responsive pedagogical approaches, which can lead to what uh, is described by Carpenter as profoundly personalised approaches to teaching and learning. And I love this phrase. He says, meet the child with differentiation, but greet them with personalisation. So whatever your planning has already taken into account with differentiation, you still need to take that individual, understand their uh, levels of engagement, their capacity to learn, and personalise it for them. The Autistic um, Education Trust um, offers, shall I say, an approach to uh, working with children on the autistic spectrum. Uh, the acronym is SPELL, Structure, Positive, Empathy, Lower Arousal and Links. Structure, often timetables, timers, small manageable chunks, visual clues, quality first teaching, realistic expectations, reward strategies and motivators, consistency, positive alternatives, strengths and special interests, if it's holes, if it's pylons, if it's bearded dragons, go for it. Okay? Special interests can take you anywhere, believe you me. Um, responsibility, independence and self-esteem, look after that well-being. Empathy. Understand the pupil's uniqueness. Understand, maybe use one-page profile, person-centred planning approaches. Look at using sensory profiles, low arousal, <coughs> environmental distractions, make sure you're doing sensory audits, think about workstations, filter out potential distractions, look at additional sources. Links. Involve the parents really involve the parents. They know so much about that child. They take food rings to cut their sandwiches into circles because their child won't eat anything that's not a circle and they don't even think that they do it anymore. Okay? Parents have devised such wonderful strategies. Um, make sure you involve the pupil. Ask them what makes a good environment, what, etc, etc. Other staff, make sure it's, it's there, outside specialists, and basically keep yourself informed. I hope you've had a um, good hour, just over an hour. 
Um, the National Forum for Neuroscience is due to meet again in London, um, probably middle of next year. Worth looking up their own on this on the NAHT website. Um, there's some fantastic online training materials um, at the, on the Complex Needs uh, website. Okay, that's me.